everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of My Veterinary Life Podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Dr. Marcy Kirk. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and we have a very special guest today. Dr. Sandra Fay will be joining us, and she is the Chief Veterinary Officer with NVA and the President-Elect of the AVMA. So as you can imagine, we have a lot to talk about. But before we jump in, I want to remind everyone that this episode is brought to you with support from our educational partner, IDEX, whose diagnostic and software solutions create clarity in the complex, constantly evolving world of veterinary medicine. And you can learn more at IDEX.com. So with that, welcome, Dr. Fay. Hi, Marcy. How are you? Thanks for having me. I am great. I am so excited to have this conversation because I think... Um, some people don't know what the road to president-elect looks like and what it means to be a chief veterinary officer. So we have a lot to cover, but we do like to start each episode the same. So can you start at the very beginning? So how did you first become interested in veterinary medicine as a career even? So growing up, we moved almost every year. So my parents um, immigrated here from Switzerland and I think my dad just would get bored or want to see a different part of the country. And literally we moved almost every year. And so it was my dad, my mom, my sister, and we always had a dog and a cat. And I think for me that really, you know, the bond that I had with my animals, I had no problems moving, but they were my buddies. They were my best friends. And so that was the one constant in my life. And I've always wanted to be a veterinarian, never wanted to be anything different. There was never any doubt. Oh, I love that. I didn't know you really, I didn't realize you moved so much. No so way. that, um, that makes sense. That can, consistent um, bond and like learning from veterinarians and things like that. So um, because we have a lot to cover, we're going to kind of fast forward. And if you could just give us a little hint of what life looked like after graduation. So after graduation, I moved to a practice in Florida and it was a small animal practice. We did a lot of um, exotics. And as you can imagine, Florida has a lot of exotics. Um, I wasn't down there all that long, unfortunately. Realized, you know, coming from Chicago, even though we moved a lot, we had finally settled in Chicago for five, six years, and I, I decided to come back home. Ended up um, moving back to a practice in Naperville and have stayed with that group pretty much the entire time um, and really had a great team, great mentorship, and it, you know, I don't regret it. And I don't regret moving down there because I learned a lot moving and living in Florida, learned a lot about what I wanted and what I didn't want. Um, so I don't regret it. So I think it's always important to try different things, even if you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because I think sometimes we have this vision of what everything's going to be like. And it's okay to try because you're going to learn regardless. Like you might learn, this is exactly what I need, but my circumstances have changed. So I'm going to try to find this thing somewhere else. Or it's like, you know, this wasn't quite what I wanted, but now I know more about what I do want and what doesn't work for me in the current stage of my life. And I think that's, um, I think that's really important. Um, and those are all steps really, they can't teach you that in school, right? Absolutely. Until you're in it, you don't know. And like having a great team, um, is super important and being close sometimes for some people to family or some familiarity as you're in those early years can really be a crucial part of the journey as well. And so taking those steps and those jumps is really important. And another step or jump that I think you probably took um, is organized veterinary medicine. So were you involved in that school or were you introduced to it after, um, after you graduated? Yeah, so I was involved in vet school. I was fortunate to be the alternate and delegate for the student AVMA. And at that time, we also had hosted Sabma Symposium. So it was I think 96 that we hosted Sabma Symposium at the University of Illinois. Um, I was elected the national Sabma president, which uh, was an amazing opportunity to meet people from all over the country. I still am friends with some of them now. Um, and to just get a really good idea of how AVMA works, how organized vet med works, how important it is. Um, and just those connections have been, have been lifelong. So once I graduated and moved back to Chicago, I attended a Chicago VMA meeting and it, they used to have an evening meeting, which was an hour CE and a little bit of business. And they had an opening for a board position. And I can't remember who I was sitting next to. I really wish I 
did remember, but they said, Hey, we have an opening in a board position. Anybody interested? And the person next to me literally went, Oh, you went like this <laughs> over my head. And that's how I <laughs> got a position on the Chicago VMA. And then that just kind of moved to president and then Illinois and then ABMA. Yeah. Um, I love those stories about being voluntold sometimes. Uh -huh. uh, and it, it is, we, we were just previously, the episode that came out the day before we're recording was with uh, Aaron Casey. And we were talking about being a, a board member and she kind of talked about how other people kind of encouraged and saw things in her. And, and sometimes it is just being present. It's the thing like showing up is sometimes just the thing you need. Um, and I think that's really important because often, and that's, really the purpose of all of the episodes that we have done for my veterinary life is to sort of show that like we are all in this veterinary profession and sometimes we see really successful people and we think wow it's just it's so shiny and new and unobtainable and sometimes it's just being there and and being in an opportunity and saying yes and um, not to minimize, many of these people are amazing and wonderful as most veterinary professionals. Um, but that started and you started local, right? You And then you expanded to the state level and then enjoyed that. And I think because you were the Illinois state president, right? Yes. And yep. then did it come House of Delegates for AVMA or? No, I actually was a delegate when I was Illinois president. I had okay. to go back and think. Um, I always, because of my experience with the student AVMA and you get a seat as the House of, AVMA House of Delegates, I knew that was always my goal and there was an opening. And so I, before I became president, so I did both at the same time um, and then moved up within the House of Delegates to the chair of the House Advisory Committee, which I always kind of explain, you know, the AVMA House of Delegates is kind of a combination of the House of Representatives and the Senate and the House mm -hmm. Advisory Chair is kind of like Speaker of the House. So um, it's a great opportunity to really interact and mingle with people from all over and really make some some changes. Yeah. And then in the next progression, you were you were the vice president. Mm -hmm. And that that was we got to intersect there because uh, part of that role was being on the early career development committee. Um, and you were part of other committees through those roles as well and had impact, which I think is really cool. Um, and so then I guess, you know, what what had you set your sights on president? What what is that process like? Because I people may not reckon, realize that, you know, it's an election, you know, there's voting that happens and uh, things like that. So can you just walk us through kind of the decision? Because it's yeah. a it's a commitment. It is. And I honestly, like when I was in school, my mentor um, became vice president and then later on went to president Joe Canarni. And so my goal had always been to be vice president because I wanted to work with the students. And my goal had never been to be president. I don't think I ever said I wouldn't do it, but it was never really my ultimate goal. But I just love being involved in organized vet med. There's so much that we do that we represent the profession in so many ways and it's just it's so exciting so um figured why not let's give it a try um it is an election it's a whole year election i happen to be running against two other candidates and so that meant traveling or zoom meetings with pretty much every state plus our ally groups so feline bovine um swine and just talking to them and letting them know who you are what you stand for what your thoughts are um, but yeah, it's a long, stressful year of, of, of just putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. Lots of doubts, lots of uncertainty, um, but it was good. I mean, again, I love meeting new people and it was a great year to do that. And I would like to say that my colleagues who ran with me became friends. So yeah. it, it was a good, a good year. Um, and then, you know, the election was this past July. If I think about that for a second, this past July in Denver. Um, and then you just start running, you know, you're elected and the next day you're in meetings and planning travel. And um, basically you are one of the spokespeople for the profession, representing the profession at states and ally groups. So the same groups that we went to, to talk, of, to ask for, you know, their vote are the same groups that we try and meet with every year and um, tell them what's going on, listen to them, learn from them, um, see what they need, how we can help and bring that back to the board. 
So really, you know, president of the ABMA is almost a four-year commitment, right? It's the the year that you're, um, you know, trying to get into the position. Then it's president elect, and then it's president, and then it's immediate past president. And everyone plays a role. It's very visible, and like you said, representing a lot of different people. It's a lot of travel um, and everything. So you know, can you just you you're representing people, but could you just give us? You know, a taste. I know that, that there's no like day to day, right? But like, what what has this year unfolded so far? Like, how much travel has it been? Is you know, if you're, is it fifty fifty with your full time job and president elect, or how does it? How do you kind of divide that? Probably about fifty fifty. Um, fortunately, my day job, I can work from anywhere now, and so I'm not a practicing veterinarian. And so, like right now, I'm in. St. Kitts visiting Ross University, but spending today working um, remotely. So I would say probably about 50-50 and it varies. So next week we have our board meeting. Those take place in Schaumburg, Illinois. And it's a, I'm drawing a blank, Wednesday through through um, Friday is the board mm -hmm. meeting. And then we actually are having the North American leadership team meeting on Saturday and Sunday. So it's the leaders from the US, from Canada and Mexico. And we will spend two full days together discussing different concerns, different things that are happening in um, each country and figuring out how we can help each other because we all have different experiences and different needs. And so it's really important to talk to each other and again, see, see what's going on so we can learn, but also see how we can help. Um, then, after that, I'm traveling. Um, I'll be going to Florida soon for the Florida Veterinary Medical Association Conference, where you know we meet with the board. Um, at these meetings, we will often um, in, install their officers. Sometimes we get to meet with their Power of Ten group. Um, just again, being there to listen and learn and hear what how we can help. We are also periodically asked for um, interviews. So I, it's usually your year of president, so I'm still just president-elect. I did one on the canine respiratory disease, and I think it was a live, was it TV? But they can be live, TV, radio, whatnot, um, just on current events and, and current concerns. So yeah, so travel probably every other week at least, going somewhere, but it's been fun. <laughs> I feel like your uh, childhood maybe prepared you for this. Yes. <laughs> You're like very well, well versed in all of this change and everything. For sure. <laughs> so uh, we, we talked a little bit about the, the roles and responsibilities, and I just think that's really neat. And as you step into the presidency at AVMA convention, because that's how our terms, you know, work, mm -hmm. um, often people come in with like, a passion that they sort of want to represent the um, profession with or what they've heard from the constituents is, do you, do you have that in mind yet? Or is that sort of, it evolves during your presidency? So a little bit of a tough question. Um, you know, I, so some of it will be evolving and it evolves, I think with each group that I talk to. Mm -hmm. um, I've said this multiple times and maybe it's kind of a cheesy answer, but I am really passionate about listening and learning and really passionate about collaborating. So I don't know exactly what route, if there's like one specific thing that that'll take me, but um, really wanting to listen and, and learn and understand, you know, I'm a small animal practitioner. I feel I have a lot of different experiences, but I have not stepped into the shoes of a swine veterinarian or a bovine veterinarian. And so I do commit to this summer spending time with different aspects of um, our profession to really understand better um, where everybody's coming from. So I think it's evolving. I think it'll change. But just knowing that we're here, we're here to represent our members, whether they're private practitioners, corporate, swine, small animal, and we want to listen. I, I love that. I mean, I think that is such a good, I mean, I think that could be a platform of, of itself. Um, and that's what as often practicing veterinarians we need to do because we might have an idea of the perfect treatment plan, but if it doesn't fit into the lifestyle of our clients, it's not the perfect, you know, treatment plan. Um, so I, I love that. And we can't come up with a treatment plan for the profession if there's something going on, unless we're listening um, to individuals. Um, so I, I do want to pivot a little bit because um, I'm really excited about, I, cause I've been able to kind of 
be I witness, I guess, <laughs> in the, in the <laughs> periphery, um, some evolution in your role at NBA. Um, because when you first started, you know, you, you worked at a clinic, right? And then you started their mentorship program, which was unlike a mentorship program I had ever um, experienced before. And I thought it was just amazing. You're sort of piloting it. And then that was wildly successful is what I'm going to say and grew. And now you stepped into the um, chief veterinary officer role. So I'm just curious if you could talk to us about that piece of it. So you've got all this organized veterinary medicine evolution going on. Meanwhile, you're carving out this incredible path um, in, in your professional life too. So um, can you just talk to us a little bit about that role? Sure. I'm going to start off by saying I never thought that this is where I would end up. Um, and I think it's really important to have open mind, have an open mind. When I started school, I was actually doing a PhD in environmental toxicology and kind of burn out on that. So went into small animal just as a backup temporary, um, ended up as a part owner in four hospitals outside Chicago. I think I may have already said that. But and the reason we had so many in our group is our motto was really if there was somebody that was interested in practice ownership, being a partner, we would help make it work for them. Um, with so much student debt, we really mm -hmm. wanted to, you know, reward those that really were interested in hardworking and, and that's what they wanted. So, um, but back in January, 2020, we sold to a corporation, we sold to MBA um, and I remained a partner in two of their clinics. They allow that, which is kind of unique, I think for cor corporations. But yeah, at, back in October, 21 was asked to pilot a mentorship program. And at the beginning, it was just me and 21 mentees. And now there's 16 mentors and about 300 mentees each year. Uh, it's really a neat program. It's uh, what we call hybrid. So we spend time in the clinics with them, helping them with surgery and dentistry, really hands-on, but then also do, you know, we have national virtual lectures. We do well-being talks. Um, we do rounds and there's a lot of retreats. So they're able to go to, um, you know, advanced surgery retreats, wellness retreats, dental retreats. Uh, and so we've really found that it's helped with retention and helped with you know, their well-being and then, you know, increased production as well. So it's super rewarding. I was vice president because I love working with the students. I know they're not students anymore, but as new grads, it's kind of a similar, similar feeling. Yeah. Um, and then back in April, received a phone call to see if I would love, like to be the chief veterinary officer for NVA. And I said, yes. And this was a brand new position for this company. It's not something that they had ever had. And so an amazing opportunity to take the role, but to create it and, and make it what I thought it, sh it should be. And I look at the role as, um, you know, when I was in private practice, or I think anybody in private practice, whether they're a managing doctor or an owner, there's always things we want to do to help our staff, help train our staff, help their well-being, help culture building, you know, so many things we want to do and we don't have time. <laughs> we don't have time. And so I see this job is a huge opportunity for me to create these tools, create these resources so that we can make the experience better or the lives better of the entire hospital team. So not just the veterinarians, but the CSRs, technicians, um, you know, give them, give them tools. And so we are working on a technician mentorship training program, um, training for managing DBMs. I mean, there's just, there's so many things in the works. It's still relatively new. I haven't been in the position for a year. I'm still formulating uh, my team and it is ever evolving, but it's an exciting opportunity and I get to work with some great people. And like I said, hopefully really make a difference. Yeah. I mean, well, you've got benchmarks, right? The mentorship program started out and it's just very, I love the idea because I was thinking about it's so brilliant on so many levels. Um, because sometimes we might have a little bit of insecurity as a newer graduate. I had this, I mean, I had great mentorship and great veterinarians and they never ever made me feel like I was asking too much or not um, up to where they should be. That was all internal dialogue, you know, that imposter syndrome, that concern. And so having someone that you're not working with every single day coming in and being dedicated to your questions and to walking you through procedures and giving you tips and stuff almost feels like just another um, safety net that's there that empowers you hopefully to continue asking questions. I mean, like when I go into the practice, I still, I mean, I ask so many questions because I love, I love the collaboration. I think <laughs> other people have other ways of viewing things and seeing things. And there's, someone's gone to one um, CE session and this new thing has been brought to their attention that might help your 
uh, patient. And so I just think that's a really cool way to introduce to, to introduce new ideas and to people. And then also having a space for the skills that we often forget as a new grad, because we're so focused on um, being the best clinical veterinarian that we can, that we neglect the communication, the well-being, which are just critical to bringing your best self to the work. So I, I just, I think it's really neat. And then, yeah, to have the opportunity to carve out this sort of new position and continue to do the things you love mm -hmm. as you do with uh, organized veterinary medicine too. Yes. It's really exciting. And I still am super passionate about mentoring. Um, I right now still have a couple of mentees and hopefully, hopefully they'll continue to ask questions and just reach out if they have a hard surgery or a bad day. So it's fun. Yeah. Oh, I just love that. Well, our, we're kind of wrapping up here because I know you've got a lot on your plate too, as we've already discussed, but I'm curious because you've sprinkled in some advice and it's um, been very helpful, but if you could really like looking back on your profession so far or on your career so far, um, do you have like a piece of advice that you'd give those of us, um, kind of in the thick of everything right now? Oh, which one to pick? <laughs> I think you the can biggest... pick more than one. It doesn't okay. have to be just one. <laughs> well, I think the biggest thing is it's okay to make mistakes. Do not be afraid. I see so many come out and they're afraid to try, afraid to do surgeries. And unfortunately, sometimes we are in situations where it's an emergency and we have to try something. And don't be afraid. Nine out of 10 times, it works out. Communicate and don't be afraid. But also don't be too hard on yourself because we are human. Yesterday at Ross University, we gave a talk on medical mishaps and how to communicate them. And everybody's going to make mistakes. We're human. The best of doctors sometimes make the biggest mistakes and it happens. And it's hard. It's sad. It's scary, but it happens. Give yourself grace. Treat yourself like you would treat your best friend. You know, if something happened to your best friend, how would you handle it? How would you, what would you tell them? Um, we're hard on ourselves. We're really hard on ourselves. So it's okay to make mistakes. I just, I, I want to just bold both of those statements and, and you really live by this. So, and I will edit this out if you don't mean to share this, but you, uh, you, you, you try things, right? And so we, you are the one that w was able to perform surgery on my previous dog. And I remember I was in there and you're like, the mass just deflated. It just like didn't, it didn't do what we thought it was going to do, but you just kept trying. And I was so appreciative of that, you know, and like, you just, you just try things, you know, and, and we got what we could out of it. So like you really do embody that and um, the not beating yourself up. That's, it's just critical. Cause we are like, I, they, when we were in school, I don't know how many times they emphasized to us, you don't do uh, steroids and, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories together. You don't do that. Or you need to be looking for Addison's. You need to be looking for, and, and I mean, those things were burned in my brain and I got out and I had a really tough case and I was like, okay, I think I'm, I think I'm going to have to put this dog on steroids. I think I'm going to have to do it. And luckily one of my fellow vets <laughs> was like, isn't that dog on a, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory? And I was like, Oh my gosh, how, like I was so tunnel vision for the problem that was in front of me. Um, and so it just, it happens, right? We think it won't, but it does. Right. Absolutely. And I feel like in school, all we will ever see is perfect. And so if something bad happens, it makes it even harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and you have to, I think that's one of the things too in school it's we're at it like mostly uh, the school we went to university of illinois um you know that's a tertiary tertiary care so it's usually been through several layers of care so we're getting a completely different picture than what the primary care sees the first time so keeping all of that in mind too so super important that's just, that's awesome awesome advice and i hope everyone takes it to heart um but i know <laughs> I like, say, let me add that yeah. you still need to know when to refer <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's yes. still important too. So yes. oh, it's yeah. a balance. It's a balance. But I think I, most of us are capable of doing more than we think we are, I guess. Is yes. Probably. Well, and it comes back, to, it circles back to that communication, right? And what the clients are able to do as well. Like you always yep. have to know what tools you have in your toolbox for them. And, exactly. and we have more than we think. Yes, so. for sure. For sure. Oh, well, Thank you so much for taking the time again in your busy travels and everything to chat with us. Cause I just, 
I just think you have such great advice from so many different areas of experience in your life and cannot wait to see what is next with all of the excitement uh, that it looks like the rest of 2024 and 2025 will bring for you. So thank, thank you. you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was fun. And we do want to thank each of you for joining us on this episode of My Veterinary Life podcast. We love sharing this journey with you. And remember, we want to hear from you. So be sure to leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen to. You can also email us with show notes or ideas at mvlpodcast at avma.org. Take care. Don't be too hard on yourself. And we'll see you next time.